How many of you started your day with a cup of coffee? I think we all know that applies to most of us. But did you know that the drink you began your morning with had its origins in the Kaffa region of Ethiopia? This is a place where coffee is still produced at scale today. You can see coffee cultivation here, how the forest has been cleared to make room for the coffee trees. But without that forest, the ecosystem gets depleted. So the farmers need a lot of irrigation and fertilizers to keep those trees growing. But the more fertilizers they use, the more degraded the ecosystem gets. So the following year, they need even more fertilizers. Unfortunately, the more these ecosystems get depleted, the less productive they become. This is a vicious cycle that is really dangerous to the people in that region. In fact, the UN suggests that this kind of vicious cycle is one of the largest contributors to land degradation across the planet. But what if we did things a little bit differently? Here I'd like to introduce Desta's coffee farm. This is a farm in the same Kaffa region of Ethiopia. But instead of removing the forest, Desta is actually working with the forest to increase productivity. So instead of removing those trees, the trees are allowed to grow into a beautiful tropical forest. He plants native coffee plants within the sunny patches in that forest. Because the forest traps water and nutrients, those coffee trees grow well without the need for fertilizers or irrigation. So the healthier the forest gets, the better the plants grow. And Desta is now even introducing honeybees, which pollinate those coffee plants, increasing their yields by up to 30%, at the same time as producing honey and wax, which he can sell. So the healthier the ecosystem gets, the better quality coffee he can produce. So he's turning that vicious cycle into a virtuous one. Scientists call these kind of cycles feedback loops. A feedback is a process that causes something to happen which then reinforces that process so it continues to grow. And feedback loops like this don't only underpin our coffee habits, they influence some of the most powerful forces in nature. Like for example after the Big Bang when atoms were distributed all over the place. But some of them were closer together than others which meant that they got pulled together with gravity. But once they'd clustered, this cluster now has more gravitational pull. Over time, the bigger those clusters get, the more gravitational pull they have, and the more elements get pulled towards them. It's feedback loops like this that continue to grow and eventually form the creation of stars and all of the matter in the known universe. Feedbacks like this underpin our evolution, the proliferation of humans across our planet. They even determine our own behavior, which is why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's also why we continue to degrade ecosystems across our planet. Feedbacks like this are immensely powerful forces. But what I want to show you today is that we're not only subject to these immense forces, because when we understand them and work with them, they can become incredibly powerful tools for positive change. The crazy thing is that our planet has not always been a habitable place. In fact, it used to be a pretty brutal place with barren rocks, volcanoes and noxious gases. We couldn't even breathe the air back then. That was until something unexpected happened. Life emerged. We still don't know how, but around 3 billion years ago, primitive bacteria developed and started spreading all over the world. Eventually, primitive cyanobacteria started releasing oxygen. And this simple process transformed the atmosphere, allowing other oxygen-dependent life forms to develop. Once those species evolved, every new species transformed the environment a little more so that new species could emerge. Over millions and millions of years, this feedback loop transformed the environment, forming an immense and interconnected web of interactions where every species depends on others to survive. They all need other species to live on, to live under, to eat, to pollinate, to fight. Yes, we even found that fighting is important for increasing biodiversity. 
When we put just two fungi in a Petri dish and allow them to fight, one of them almost always kills the other and the system collapses. But when we add a third species to the Petri dish, they often fight against the dominant species, allowing the other individual to survive. It's like a rock, paper, scissors scenario where the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the more species that we include in the area, the more likely we are to find those intransitive loops that increase the chances that all species survive. And that's just with three or four fungi sprouting in a lab. Now imagine the infinite web of interactions in an ecosystem with all sorts of plants, birds, mammals, insects, microbes, fungi, the more connected this network becomes, the more species it can support. Diversity begets diversity. Life leads to more life. It's the perfect feedback loop. At a global scale, biodiversity feedbacks can even regulate our climate. Because diverse environments lock away carbon in the long term, which leads to a more stable climate which benefits that biodiversity, leading to an even more stable climate. The more species there are in that system, the more stable the cycle becomes. And that feedback loop has built favorable climate conditions that have allowed us to thrive. Which means that biodiversity is our life support system. But, as we are all aware, humans are now breaking this essential cycle. Our exploitative approach to growth is degrading the ecosystems that support us, turning them back into the lifeless landscapes that we had before. By now, we've altered about 70% of the Earth's vegetative land, and less than 5% of the remaining ecosystems are still in their natural, interconnected state and our excess carbon emissions are causing climate change which is weakening the essential life support system even more. The more we exploit, the more we grow. This new feedback loop is only a couple of centuries old, but it's already grown beyond our control, and it's initiating new feedback loops that are accelerating the problem further. For example, we found that in a warming climate, rising temperatures can cause microorganisms in the soil to release more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which can accelerate the rate of warming. This leads to additional carbon losses, leading to more warming. And feedback loops like this are being felt across every ecosystem. The more ice that melts in a warming climate, the less reflective our planet becomes, so more heat is trapped, driving more ice melting. Drier forests lead to less carbon storage, leading to more fires, leading to more carbon emissions, and the list goes on. In short, we are actively changing our environment back into the one that humans are not adapted to thrive in. The power of these global feedbacks is overwhelming and intimidating. And it feels like we as individuals can do nothing to help fight against them. But what we've learned, and in fact this is what drives all of our ongoing research, Instead of pushing back against these feedbacks, we can actually learn to work with feedbacks to drive opportunities for positive change. And nature holds many of the seeds to drive these kinds of feedbacks. And we're only just beginning to understand the scale of that opportunity. A few years ago, we conducted a study to map tree density across the global forest system. This revealed that our Earth is home to just over three trillion trees. But using these same approaches, we could also see that outside of urban and agricultural lands, there's about 0.9 billion hectares where trees would naturally exist. If we could protect those areas, there's room for a trillion new trees to naturally recover. And if they could reach maturity, then the regenerating forest would capture up to 30% of the excess carbon that we'd released into the atmosphere to date. This massive potential really helped to put nature on the map. It became clear that nature is a very real and tangible part of our fight against climate change. It's critical to protect the nature that we still have and revitalize what we can, to stop the damage and start the repair. And when the media reported our findings, this idea went viral. You know something strange is happening when Al Gore and Donald Trump both start talking about the power of trees. And the more people talked about it, the bigger the idea became. 
It even inspired the UN and World Economic Forum to launch their Trillion Tree campaigns, just in time for the launch of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Nature restoration was going mainstream. But it wasn't yet a feedback loop, because it didn't have self-sustaining momentum. Nature is not just an easy way out, or an excuse to ignore our devastating carbon emissions. And restoration is not a top-down global challenge. In fact, when people make this mistake, the results can be devastating. Too often, it can result in mass plantations of trees, a blanket that are so often composed of just a single species, a monoculture, which destroys the thousands of species that would naturally exist there. These vast plantations are not sustainable and they can be devastating to the local biodiversity and the people who depend on it. The economic systems that got us into this situation are themselves driven by incredibly powerful and often destructive feedback loops. You can't just push against them by planting a few trees. Yes, these global declarations can be useful for raising awareness, but real global scale restoration can only be achieved through a bottom-up movement where local communities across the world are empowered to build their own positive feedback loops and drive their own momentum. And that is why we've built Restore, an online digital platform to facilitate thousands of projects across the globe. Restore is like a Google Maps, but for restoration. So instead of seeing cities and shops, you'll see conservation projects or sustainable farms. These practitioners around the world can use it to gain ecological insights but also to connect with one another across the planet. So far, over 120,000 local sites have started using Restore to rebuild their local ecosystems. And when we look across all of those projects, one feature emerges as the key to restoration success. Projects are most likely to succeed when they find the solutions that make biodiversity the economically sustainable option for local people. When healthy nature becomes the economic choice, you cannot stop this feedback from gaining momentum and developing across the landscape. So let's go back to Desta's coffee farm in Ethiopia, which we can see here on Restore. On the left, you can see all of the ecological data that he uses to make his decisions, showing which native species grow in the region and the environmental conditions that support. He can also get monitoring data to see carbon and water storage and how it changes over time in response to his decisions. But by far the most valuable thing for Desta is the connectivity. On Restore, he's connected to the entire restoration movement. He's visible to investors who might be interested in the company or to his customers who can now see where their coffee comes from. With Restore, those customers can begin to understand the impacts of the coffee that they are drinking. And this is having a huge effect on business. Because business is booming, the economic benefits are being felt by the entire community. Through this process, other farmers in the area are starting to protect forests so that they can recover on their land to improve coffee production. There's even discussions in the local school about setting up a new forest conservation area to grow sustainable coffee within. What we're seeing is the beginnings of a new feedback loop happening at the landscape scale, where protecting nature leads to more economic sustainability, which leads to more protection of nature. This is a lovely story, but until now, people like Desta have been working in isolation. But the best part of stories like this is that we are seeing them all across the planet in every ecosystem type. In Northern Europe, we see farmers introducing mixed species into their landscapes to increase agricultural yields at the same time as increasing carbon capture. In Kenya, we see the planting of native trees to improve the fertility of agricultural yields for local communities. When nature becomes the economically viable option for people, you cannot stop it from growing across the landscape. Each of these projects is for the local biodiversity and the people who depend on it. But as that network of collective action grows, it benefits all of us. With tools like Restore, we have access to the entire environmental movement here in our pockets. We can support it by volunteering or donating, by buying their sustainably sourced products, or even by rewilding our own back gardens. 
With this tool, everyone everywhere can engage in the movement. And this positive mass action is how we can collectively build a powerful new feedback loop. The more projects that come online, the more useful it becomes to the public. And the more of us that join up, the more it empowers those projects, so even more of them will sign on. Because what we consistently find is that the ability for us to engage is a tremendous source of momentum. When 8 billion people build positive, reinforcing feedback loops like this all over the world, transformative change is not only possible, it's likely. We have transformed our planet before, which means it's in our grasp to do so again, but in a positive direction too, so that nature and humans can thrive.